Hello everyone, I'm Edward Foster and I'm in the workshop of Lawrence Dodd who made my wonderful six course Renaissance lute. In this video we're going to talk about uh, how Lawrence made this beautiful, beautiful instrument and a bit of historical, um, you know, a bit of history about it as well, etc. So, uh, hi Lawrence. Hello. So, um, well, I've got lots of questions for you. Before we get into the lute, um, you've made, this is the third instrument you've, I've got off you now. I've got a seven course lute, which is a later Renaissance uh, lute. I've also got an Anglo-Saxon lyre mm -hmm. as well. Um, but about a year ago, I got this beautiful instrument from you. So I'm going to ask about yourself, first of all, before we get into this. And what, why are you a luthier? <laughs> first and foremost, you, what, why, why, why has that become um, your job, and but not just your job, but your passion as well? Um, <clears throat> well, I, we, my father and I got into making instruments, um, originally through the harpsichord, um, because I, I wanted a harpsichord, but you know, they're expensive and we couldn't afford one. So we thought, well, maybe we could restore one. And we, we did manage to find one and we restored it. And that's really how we got onto the ladder of, 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 of restoring and making instruments. And my father developed an interest in the lute. And it sort of snowballed from there when he decided to have a go at it. And he, was, he had confidence from working with harpsichords. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, people often assume that we learned, or rather they assume that I learned from my father, but it was actually more of a symbiotic relationship. Um, and we were you know, teaching each other and learning, and that's how we got into making stringed instruments. So, so really it was um, the passion of playing and the music too, that led you to experiment in making and then you just got so involved with it and you loved it and and that's how you sort of learned. Is that your apprenticeship was was in a sense trial and error. Obviously there's a lot of research and and, and study too as well. So it is that well, it was it was very much a musical journey because at first, before we were doing it professionally. It was a case of always, I mean, it still is to a degree, to a great extent, but it, it was very much then, starting out, a search or a quest for a musical desire, like a, what, what you had this concept of what you wanted to hear and get from an instrument, and you mm -hmm. just pursued that experimentally over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh. And of course, that never stops. You're always doing that, but of course you get into more of a routine as you become more experienced. Yeah, yeah. So how long, I mean, how long have you been making loops? Have you been um, Adrian? Well, professionally since 2016. Yeah. Um, but obviously we were doing things before that. So, so you've been developing it over 10 years or more, something like that, and then in the last seven, eight years, it's become your vocation, really, hasn't it? Um, and you made a lot of beautiful instruments. Um, so, you, we, I mean, this is a six course Renaissance lute, um, but also you, you, you do Baroque, don't you? Um, Baroque lutes, um, also Baroque guitar, I know you've made. Um, you've done an Anglo Saxon layer for me, so you, and you've got medieval lutes. So, you cover quite a range of, of years, don't you? Mm. On the instruments that you make. I mean, we're gonna we'll look at some of the other instruments that you make later on. We're gonna I'll share some pictures on this video, and they're absolutely beautiful. Right, so let's discuss um, the different parts of what makes a Renaissance six-course lute. So, I mean, it's, 
before we do that, I mean, I just want to say how beautiful it is. Look at that. Gorgeous. All this bit. We'll, we'll be showing uh, images uh, on the screen as we talk so you can get a close up of the different things. So let, let's start first of all with um, the rose, which is in the, the centre here. Um, so this is carved directly into the soundboard because obviously people often assume it's inserted um, but it, traditionally they were always carved directly in the surface um, and this is the original design that goes with this what what this instrument is based on originally and does it have a specific name this rose or um, it's, it's usually just referred to as the girl rose the girl i mean rose. there are other loops with similar designs and, and even the same design but it's, it's closely associated in, in the modern imagination with this instrument. And, and does each rose always have to be carved out of the soundboard like that? Is, is that right? They're all done like that? All, well, all, almost all looped family instruments have the rose carved out of the soundboard. Right. Are, some, some historically do have them inserted, but that was probably done you know, retrospectively, and sometimes they do have parchment roses, but that's quite rare. Because I, I can imagine that being quite a tricky process, and it, you must have a lot of concentration for that, because if you go wrong, you, you'd have to <laughs> um, almost start it again, you know, if it went really wrong, for instance, you do it in the soundboard, aren't you? It's quite an intense process, <laughs> <laughs> and you spend, you know, spend a lot of time very close to, and you, you've got to take your time with it. Because right. you can get very, it's, it's quite fatiguing on your eyes and your hands. So, I mean, a uh, fascinating, because I'm, I'm an artist painter and I get this question all the time. I think, why does everyone ask me this question? And then looking at this now, I know why everyone asks me this question. I'm going to ask you the same question. How long does something <laughs> like that take? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, a, I mean, a rough idea, it depends on the intricacies of the rows, of course. But say this one, what's a rough. Well, with, well, with a design like this, I mean, obviously, it, it, like, as you pointed out, this varies depending on the rose mm -hmm. and also the material of the board, because if it's a particularly hard material, because soundboard wood does vary a bit, um, it can be more or less strenuous or stressful, and it takes longer. Yeah. Um, but normally I would carve a rose like this over three or four days but that's not that's not continuous work no, you'd that's have for to, a few hours each day i suppose you'd have to have little breaks from that wouldn't you because of the intensity of the work as well you know um, and also if you're doing something for a long time it, you know you have to be aware don't you? you have to be um be able to focus so you need little breaks and that that's good cool. oh, that's wonderful yeah um so let's have a look at some other some of bits now i mean this we could Spend the whole video just talking about the road, for instance, couldn't we? So, because um, we're on the front, so um, the soundboard then. So um, you can't really see inside there, but there's all sorts of interesting things to it, isn't there? So the front is alpine spruce, yeah, um, which is the traditional um, tone wood for lutes, um, and it's very thin. So at, at most two millimetres in this sort of area here. Mm -hmm. um, but it can go down to one and a half or less. Goodness me. Um, although on, on, on six course loops, but more, more archaic loops, you tend to want to stay on the, at the thicker end of the spectrum. Um, because over time, soundboard, loot soundboards got thinner. So they had, and to stiffen them, they've got bars. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you mean by bars? So you have a piece of wood that's also spruce mm -hmm. running perpendicular to the front on the back glued on, so horizontally. Right. Um, at proportions along the board. And would that change with the type of loot that you're making? Or is that a standard? Well, there, are a lot, there are different schemes for different instruments, but there are there's broad sort of traditions or schools that instruments fall into, categories. So there's a lot of similarities between a lot of different instruments. Right. In terms of the layout. 
And also, you, I, I, I remember when you were um, you showed me um, soundboards when you've been constructing them, and you, you tap on them, don't you, to check the sound. So you've got to develop your ear for this, haven't you? This innate sense of when it's right. There's a alchemical relationship there between the maker and the instrument, isn't there? There's something quite magical about that. Well, it's, it's a very intuitive process. Yeah. Um, it's something that I learn more about every time. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's taken years of experience to understand what I'm hearing. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a qualitative process in the sense that you're tapping with a mind to preemptively hearing what it will sound like later on mm. when it's an instrument and you are you, you're trying to you, you're not necessarily hearing what you're going what is go, going to be the end product because you have to modify it to get that so for instance when you thin the soundboard initially mm -hmm. you actually want this depends on the lute type, but if you if you not so much with six courses, but with with the common Renaissance later Renaissance like seven course lutes, you're going thin enough that it's actually slightly beyond what is acoustically desirable, because then you stiffen it up with the bars. So what you're hearing when you initially tap it is not really quite what you're aiming for later on. Right. With an instrument like this, um, like I say with six course lutes, the board, you're trying to keep it a bit thicker and, ha and you have fewer bars often um, than on a later lute. Um, because the stiffness is you're impar it's imparted by the board more than the bars, yeah. um, proportionately speaking. Mm -hmm. um, it's you're taking it near to that near to that limit. You're still getting very close to that limit, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's quite a fine area. And it, obviously, if you go too far, you can't reverse it. You've you've taken the wood away, and that's yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess there must have been a lot of trial and error when you were initially doing. Oh, we, we, some of the early instruments we built were they. You know, we're doing them experimentally. The boards were too thin, or sometimes too thick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, if it's too thick, you can thin it again, but not the other way around. In a, in a way, I, I, I mean, the sound board's very crucial to the sound. Obviously, very, very crucial. You're never really going to. I mean, you get loops that are very similar in the sound, but they're always always have a slight personality of their own, aren't they? Because of this process. A lot of hand-built instruments are like that. Well, most yeah. hand-built instruments are like that. They have their own personality. They're of a similar feel. They might be in the same family, in a way, but they have their own individual personality. How oh, fascinating with that one. Well, the, the, uh, you find that boards sound different inherently. So you can, you can get them to a thickness where, say, two boards are... They're, they're essentially the same, but they still sound different because the wood itself sounds different. Mm. So they can never actually be identical. Right. Gosh, fascinating. We could, we could do a whole video on that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, have a, let's have a look at some other bits and bobs. So let's have a look at the back, because obviously you don't see the back when the, a player is playing it, because you just see the front, but it's a beautiful back. And these are ribs, aren't they, on the back? Mm. So do you want to talk about the, the back a little? Um, so this lute's made of rippled sycamore. Um, and each one of these surfaces is a separate piece, yeah. which we call staves or ribs. Mm -hmm. um, and they are thinned down to the point where you can bend them. Yeah. And they're glued edge to edge on a mould. Mm -hmm. So you, you work around on the mould yeah. until you end up with a bowl. And this one's got how many ribs is this one? This one. Um, this is a nine. Le eleven. Oh, sorry, that's no, nine. Yeah, nine. Is but they do, is it nine and eleven usually with the 
Yeah, uh, both in the, yeah. uh, that period nine, but later on, did they have more or something? Ribs. Um, well, there, there, there's there are a lot of different numbers of ribs on the instrument. Right. Okay. Um, there's from a... nine is the lowest number, <laughs> um, but you get multi rib holes later on with you know tens and tens of ribs. So I mean, would of this period would it usually be nine or eleven, of uh, so early fifteen hundreds into late fifteen hundreds for the six course. I guess I get I guess you get a lot of variation still then, but would it have usually been nine or eleven ribs, or would it have been the odd extra ones now? Um, it it does seem looking at the iconography. Although it, it, there there isn't that much iconography that shows backs, there's usually the front. But yeah. From what we what there is, what we can see, um, it, it does seem that a lot of the earlier loops have fewer ribs, right. and later on they get fancier, more elaborate, and you have then more and more ribs. Yeah. Now I I love the patterning of this back, but some 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 uh, loops. Um, were decorated, weren't they, as well, mm -hmm. on the back, and 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 and, all, and they had striped different woods as well for striped patterns with inlays in between and things like that. So well, there, there are some um, surviving loops by well, a couple of I think more they might there might be more than a couple of bowls by Unverdorben, mm -hmm. and they're, they're quite elaborate marquetry. that's sort of almost sort of Escher-like. Yeah. In terms of the fact it's, it scales down all the way down the taper of the rib. No, I I, I saw those loops. When, at first, when I saw them, I haven't seen them in flesh, but I've seen pictures. And when I first saw them, I thought, ah! <laughs> and then I thought, ooh, I mean, that's really, they're really lovely. I think I love wood. I love the grain of wood. I love the patterns within natural wood. But I also really love those patterns. I think they're beautiful. Wonderful. So, shall we have a look at their. At the head, I know again we could spend the whole video on the back and every bit of it, but this is fascinating. So this, as you can see, if, if anyone's watching who plays guitar or any other instrument like this, uh, you can see this angles this way. So <laughs> it's very different to a guitar, is that? And that's part of this wonder. I mean, the instrument itself is aesthetically wonderful and pleasing to the it's, eye. It's surprising how many people, when they first see these, say, "Oh, is it?" Is it is it broken? <laughs> it's a broken guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why why is it got that way? Um, no, no one actually knows the reason. There are different theories. Uh -huh. um, one theory is that it allows the instrument to stand up if it's put on its side. Yeah. Otherwise, it would roll over. Mm -hmm. um, another theory which I think is quite plausible, um, is the way that it changes the string bearing on the knot. So if, because the strings are running around a corner, it's, it's essentially pulling the strings down on the front of the knot. Right. Whereas on a guitar or an instrument with a, with a, a, you know, a, a peg box that's running parallel to the neck, you have to have um, very well-fitted grooves for the string mm. um, because they're not held down so much with the foot, you know, with the tension. So in that sense, it, it does make it easier to fit the strings on the nut, the bed more easily. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. And, and it's a different piece of wood, isn't it, at the top, to the neck, isn't it, this, the head? Um, to the neck of the guitar, it's a different piece that's been slotted in. Yeah, the peg box is a separate thing to the neck, it's, yeah. it's glued on and there isn't a nail or a screw there. It's just glued. It's just glued. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful, I mean it's beautiful to look at. One last thing on the on the different parts, I think, are the, the, the pegs, the tuning pegs. Uh, I'll show a close-up of these, but these are heart-shaped. Really beautiful. Um, why are these heart-shaped? Um, why did you why did you make them arch? Well, it's a, it's a traditional shape for Renaissance loops, um, and it, you see it a lot in pictures. 
um, and the original of this instrument also has heart pegs. Um, and th these are turned and then carved. Well, interestingly, on the original, apparently, they're not turned, they're actually carved entirely. Right. So what do you mean by turned? Turned on? On a lathe. On a lathe. So you turn them on a lathe and, and then you carve them. But originally they, they weren't turned, they were just carved. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, these, they're made, these are plum, the wood here. Yeah. There's different, different sorts of wood on the instrument, isn't there? So, um, and very quickly, we'll just have a look at the... This is the bridge, obviously, where the strings. We're going to talk about the strings and the courses in a moment, but this this is the the bridge with a lovely design. Is this like a a design of that time again? Oh, well, this, again, this is based closely on the original. Yeah. Um, but it is it's very typical of the kind of bridges that you see in painting. Right, and and then these are are these little flowers? Yeah, the little flower ends. bits of the lute etc we haven't talked about the strings and I keep saying and you keep saying courses and everyone's thinking what's this who doesn't play a lute what, what are courses well we've got we've got this this uh, lute has 11 strings doesn't it mm -hmm. but five of these strings are double strings there's two strings and apart from this the highest string highest sounding string the, the singing string isn't it that's what it's called chanterelle. the chanterelle um that's the only one that's on its own. Do you want to tell me about lute strings and lute courses? Um, Especially this one, the six course one. So to people familiar with guitars, it's often strange to be presented with something with pairs of strings. Um, and you play them as pairs, not not you don't play them individually. Um, and some of these on the six course lute are tuned in, in unison, i.e. at the same pitch, mm -hmm. so the second and third courses. Um, but the fourth, the fifth and the sixth are tuned with an octave. So you have with a unison to the same pitch and with an octave So one's lower and one's higher, an octave higher. But one's an octave lower, obviously. <laughs> um, and of course, originally it would have been strung in gut. Um, but this one's strung in Nile gut, which is a modern synthetic, it has properties similar to gut. So gut as in, would that have been sheep? Gut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although often these days, if people do use gut, it's it's f quite frequently um, beef gut. Oh, right, okay. Um, but you, as you can see here on this one, these bottom two courses are, have red strings. Yeah. Um, which is, in, in, in this case, it's, a, it's what's called, it's a loaded, um, it's essentially loaded nylon, or loaded nile gut. Um, because as the, as you as this, if you as you go down in pitch, the strings um, get thicker. Mm -hmm. But a thick string doesn't have it, it, it's, it's stiffer and it loses some of those higher harmonics. It loses that fidelity, mm -hmm. which is the reason why on the lute 
you have the octaves because they fill in some of the higher harmonics. And also the loading makes the string heavier so it can be thinner to preserve more of I its see, see, resonance. Because it's, I mean, because I come from a guitar background and initially when I was playing octave, it was very strange. When, when I got into it, it was wonderful. And especially learning the Renaissance loop technique with the thumb of the finger, it makes a big difference. And you can do things harmonically on the lute that you can't do if it was just a single string or if it was just a unison, you know, the same pitch. To have that octave tuning is beautiful and it adds something, you know. You feel like there's a different voice coming in as well. It, it lifts it, I think, mm -hmm. lifts the music. Um, well, it's integral to a lot of the music from that era in terms of the voice leading. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, only, if you only have the bass strings without octaves, you're losing that top voice. Um, of course, in some of the later music, they, they, they did move over to having more unisons over time, um, which is, is one of the reasons for having different loops, because you can play later music with the unisons, but it, it's not, it doesn't really suit the early music so much. No, necessarily. no yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, initially I got the seven course loop on me, so I would play some of the Francesco, the Milano music and that on it, and it's nice, but when you play it on this, it's perfect for it, it's wonderful, especially, but you have to really develop that thumb and finger mm -hmm. technique, so you can do the runs and the basses, etc. Um, you really notice that. Um, lute is based on a historical model that still exists, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's based on an instrument by George Gurler. Um, and it was made in Innsbruck originally uh, in 1680, sorry, in 1580. Yeah. And the, the label um, says 1580 on it, but it's not. Obviously, you, you can't ever say with absolute certainty that the label is correct in that sense, mm. given that, you know, it, throughout history there have been, um, you know, labels can be changed or forged or whatever, but it's, we, it's fairly certain that it was built in 1580 in Innsbruck. Um, and it was, um, the original is made of ivory. Nice. Um, as is quite common on surviving instruments, because being such a precious object, they, they've survived disproportionately. Um, and it's only one of two instruments that have, su has survived, you know, of a six course time. Mm -hmm. um, thought to be al al almost entirely original, unlike the other example, which is the Bear Tifa Brooker, which is near, nearly entirely surviving, but there are aspects which have been changed. Um, so in some ways, it, you could say it's the most important surviving loop that there is. Right. Um, because it's, it's, it, it's entire, almost entirely original and represents the loop at its height when it was the most, well, it established its reputation as an instrument. Oh. Um, and was obviously the height of the Renaissance. So, I mean, uh, probably the, it's hard to say exactly, isn't it? But maybe the first, well, not the first, but earliest six course loop would have been from just before 1500, the late 1480s, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could have been something before, but because of the music that was written, because they changed then from uh, plectrum playing to using the fingers, didn't they? In the late sort of, 
around the 1480s or something like that. Or, again, we can't be exactly certain of that. But so they would have had to have had um, a six course lute for that time. And of course, you've got all the famous composers of the early 1500s. Um, well, the first composed. published music was by Spinachino. Hmm. Um, for six course lute. Um, and that was in the, the beginning of the 16th century. But we, I mean, it's it's fairly certain that it was. You you can't say that the first published date is when something begins. It's no. there's something had to lead up to that. And also, we don't know what's been lost. It was before that. There could have been other music that would have been written down, you know, in the manuscript form, not printed, but in the manuscript, and that could have just you know, five hundred years <laughs> could have easily disappeared. So we know, but we know that from at least fifteen hundred, probably fourteen eighties, there would have been a a six course loop like this mm -hmm. um, round and how long did the six course last because the other instruments came in didn't they the bigger they got they got bigger and bigger the loop so the six course when did its popularity sort of go was it in the 1600s well it, the last published music for the six course um is i think it's around the second decade of the 17th century mm. Um, I forget exactly when, but it's, it's that period. Mm. Um, but and it, and it seems that that it was England was possibly the last place where it was being played, mm. um, because of course they went over to seven courses and then eight courses and, and so on. They kept adding co base courses. Yeah, and they got bigger and bigger, didn't they, all the loops, and they, they changed, you got longer necks, everything, it was, it's quite fascinating, and, and, um, and there's a lot of different kinds of loops. <laughs> there is, indeed, yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> just to wrap, you know, wrap up on this historical loop before we finish, I mean, it's, um, what's it like to make something that was around 500 years ago, how, how does it feel? In a sense, because we always talk about the practicalities of making things, but how does it feel? When I play this lute, and I play the music written 500 years ago, to me it's spellbinding, and it's um, deeply emotional as well, and also highly, I feel, highly intellectually challenged and motivated, and all these different things too, you know, it's, you can't, you can't just distance yourself emotionally from something, so when you're making this, based on something 500 years old and making it aesthetically as beautiful and as practical, you know, in its use as it's, um, you know, as high, as high as its aesthetic beauty. How, how do you, and it's very hard to sum up, but if you could sum it up briefly, how, how does it feel? Um, you feel you're in touch with, with a tradition. It's not, it's not a living tradition, it's been rediscovered in the 20th century. Um, unlike, say, violin making, which is a continuous tradition. Um, but you're, or as I feel, I'm tapping into... It's a, it's a musical and artistic need and that the loop fulfills and was sadly largely forgotten for a period but now luckily now we you know we we have these things and we can um enjoy them again um but it did it, it, it does feel like you're tapping into a another it does feel like another world um i'm sure that it must feel like that for you playing the music yeah 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 it, it does but it feels um feels very natural, um, doesn't feel like there's a big gap, it feels like there's something, it feels like a, an, an era of beauty that I'm going into <clears throat> and by actually um, playing the music of that time it speaks to me because a lot, a lot of the music that, that was written in the, the first part of the 16th century, Francesco, Milano, etc, I mean it's, it's, it's polyphony really Different, different notes, so different like voices are going on. We're not not necessarily like chords as we think of it on the mm -hmm. guitar. It's like different voices, and that's what you're playing. So you're hearing these different voices singing on this gorgeous instrument. That's how it feels.
Cool. Well, that was great chatting to you about that. So, um, <clears throat> now I know you make lots of different instruments. So, at the end of this video, I'll keep watching folks because I'm going to put lots of images on um, as, as a video end so you can see some of the other instruments you make because you, you do. You, do, you make instruments really from, we did an Anglo-Saxon layer from me, so that's, that's quite old. But usually from about, you've done medieval lutes, haven't you? Up until... Well, the, the, the latest instrument we've made, or um, well, that we offer, is, is um, what you could call an early classical mandolin. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was the Brescian or Cremonese mandolin is sort of around the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. So really, so you, 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 if, if you, you take out the layers in a way, if you go from, you, you're making instruments for about a good 500 years really, aren't you, in a span of 500 years. And But I know you could, you might even go a bit earlier with some of these other ones, maybe some open medieval well, that's the, that's We're intending to go earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I know that, you, I know you're going to be making a lovely instrument for me of a whaler, which is um, Spanish equivalent of the Renaissance lute. So um, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> we could do a video on that perhaps. Um, but I'm gonna, like I say, show the images, but I also put a, a link to Lawrence and Adrian's um, website. So you could, it'll be in the comments, um, in the description, sorry, as well as the comments. Um, there'll be links there, but um, apart from your website, you've got a Facebook page, have you? a Facebook page. Yeah, so what, what's the name of, of your Facebook page? Uh, well, it, we're, we're, the business is called Dodd Luthery. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you type that into Facebook. Yeah, that'll come up. And you put things on there, don't you, like when you're making stuff and what what you're doing, etc. And then there's a website as well mm -hmm. on there. So, um, there's plenty of them to do. And lovely lad, and his dad's really nice too, very approachable. Very good to talk to and chat about all your loot and um, dreams <laughs> and schemes. But yeah, I, I recommend taking up a loot and enjoying it. Thanks, Lawrence. Well, thank you very much for having this conversation. No, my pleasure.